Welcome back, everyone. All right. Uh, so the next uh, set of lectures is going to be by uh, John Wan Ha, and he will tell us about topological phases for robust quantum memories. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, so my title is well, I guess good idea to to, to write here. There are two well, technical words here, topological phase and robust quantum memory, neither of which is technically too well defined in my opinion. Uh, but I pretend that they are well defined and discuss about it and hope to develop some intuition what the problem status is and uh, somehow convey, convey my perspective. Uh, you have heard about at least two lectures series of lectures on the quantum error correction. And I heard that John Martinez gave a, a brief mention on the uh, prototypical example of topological phase, the toric code. Uh, but I thought it's again a good idea from a, a mathematical point of view to repeat the formalism of, well, uh, derive the properties of the toric code and generalize to higher dimensions. And then uh, extract some mathematical structure out of it, which will be used later. Uh, that's the goal. So. For this first lecture, uh, I'm going to uh, review uh, in a very solid way the toric codes in various dimensions and list uh, uh, error correcting properties from which you can uh, read some intuition out of it and prove their equivalences. Oh, um, it, it is on. Uh, yeah, it is on. Maybe I can. Does it make better? Does hello? Does it make better? Yes. Ah. So just to review the uh, um, quantum error correction, let me give you two exercises. Uh, depending on the response, I will solve it here, or I'll let you solve. Uh, So if you I uh, if you are very familiar with the stabilizer code, uh, these two problems should be should feel easy. Uh, and let me give you some hint. <laughs> uh, 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 for both of them, uh, it is very beneficial to write down the projector onto the code space. Well, remember that the stabilizer code code space the code space is given by the common eigenspace of eigenvalue plus one. Well, eigenvalue can be tuned anyway, but 
we, just, we stick with the plus one, of commuting set of poly uh, operators. Poly, poly operators are tensor product of poly matrices, uh, that are Hermitian. And uh, yeah. Sorry. Can you define what one independent? Oh. So okay. Maybe I should do. Maybe I should solve this problem here then. Uh, oh, you mean you, you're bringing in an extra one? Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You already have some. And yeah. Uh, yeah. The 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 word that are in the quote quotation mark is some words that you have to define yourself. That's a part of your exercise too. <laughs> <laughs> How's the physical difference? Sorry. How's the physical difference? How the physical. Yes, 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 yes. The full, full hyperspace. Okay. Uh, uh, is everyone confident to solve these exercises? Uh, should I interpret it as yes or no? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Okay. Well, let me solve it for you then. Thanks as you can. Sorry. Thanks as you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, then problem number one. What's the? So, if you give me a, a stabilizers, which I denoted by G. Uh, I mean, there are many of them. How do you how do you write down uh, the set of vectors in the full Hibbert space that are stabilized by that operators? If you are if you have studied the uh, group rep representation theory, the answer is that you average over all group elements. So you consider you make a group a multiplicative group in this case uh, generated by these. Poly, poly operators. So let me denote the group by S, noting stabilizers. And then you sum over all uh, that group elements. In the example, um, if you have, say, uh, bell pair stabilized by both ZZ and XX, we know that the answer is the, the state we are seeking is just this one. But I could write down the projector onto this state by forming a linear combination of products of these. Uh, the minus sign here is because y is i times xc. Uh, that th those two i squares minus 1. And you properly normalize it. And this explicit operator is exactly It's just uh, equal. Um, it's four by four matrix, so you can expand it to check if you wish. Um, okay, so this is an example. This is more general formula. You sum over all uh, uh, stabil uh, stabilizer operators in that group. It's not only a generator; it's, it's a formally group. So, if there, if you had a uh, uh, say K or S, well, yeah. Let, let, let me let me reserve the, the letter K for the number of encoded qubits later. If you have S stabilizer generators, then the multiplicative group it generates contains two to the S elements in it, including identity. So you should divide by this, um, uh, the order of the group, but that is two to the S. Uh, and this is my projector onto the code space. Is it clear why that's non zero? Good question. I d it may be zero. Uh, it, it becomes zero if, uh, in this in this example. For example, if I insist that I, my uh, stabilizer group is generated by these two elements, they are anti-commuting. If you literally average over, then it becomes zero. 
And this is related to the fact that we, uh, uh, we insist on the commutativity and also the fact that the stabilizer group should not contain minus 1. Once you include, if you, even if you start with the uh, commuting operators, if you include minus 1, then every term appears with a plus sign and minus sign. So they cancel, so it becomes 0. So you're, you're the, the, the necessary condition when you define a stabilizer code that we should not include minus 1 translates to the fact that my projector should not vanish. OK? Now, what's the code space dimension? You have a, some linear operator that is orthogonal projector onto your uh, 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 subspace. What's the dimension of that range? Take the trace. Um, now we make use of a special property of a Pauli matrix. What's the trace of a sigma x? Zero. What's the trace of sigma z? Zero. Trace of sigma y is also zero. What's the trace of sigma tensor i, say? Tensor product, when you trace it, Well, because of this formula, whenever you have a, a, a non-identity element in, in your string of poly pro tensor product of uh, poly matrices, then because of this, the trace vanishes whenever it is non-identity. So in this formula, well, this is scalar vector. So trace is linear, so I, I gather out the, uh, the vector. But all I get is just identity. All the other just vanishes. Clear? OK. Then, but what's this? You're tracing over an identity element that acts on the full hyperspace. This is the, this minus s is what I, what I wanted. Uh, so the one independent stabilizer generator translates to the to this number of jet generators counted multiplicatively. When you, when, you, when you say something independent, you should specify what, what you mean by that. Here, independence means that they are not related by multiplication of anything else. So the 2 to the n is full Hilbert dimension. You get minus s, one for each stabilizer generator. Therefore, you have proved that. And you have uh, properly endowed a meaning for what we mean by independent by looking at this formula. OK. Uh, now, once we, well, given this, the exercise two is even easier. Now, we don't look for the code, st code itself. We just look for the one particular state in it uh, that happens to be stabilized by some uh, Pauli matrices. Oh, by the way, this formula, again, also proves that the number of independent stabilizers Num yeah, cannot be larger than n, because dimension cannot be smaller than 1. Okay. But you didn't prove that this is a projector, actually, no? It is a projector by, almost by construction. OK. How do you prove that? Is this Hermitian? Obviously, by the choice of the group. We have collected Hermitian matrices only. Um, Oh, that's not the proper reason. Uh, the more proper reason is that the group itself contains Hermitian conjugate. And you sum over all possible group elements. Uh, yeah, Hermitian matrices do not qualify to be Hermitian when you make a product of it. But you know, when you average of all possible combinations, then the combination becomes Hermitian. And if you, how do I square it? The scalar factor square. And you get a double sum. But this is a group. So I could relabel it as GH, say, F. I could equate, to equate this F. Then it becomes 2 to the 2S sum over uh, 
f, where f is g and h. But there are exactly two such, uh, I'm sorry, you can, you can solve it for f. So g is, and h is arbitrary. Right? So the summation over h now becomes redundant. So you get factor of s, which is the order of the group, divided by the order of group squared, and the same expression. So you get the same, exactly the same. This, this is the standard, the, this is the first formula when you think of a representi representation theory. You think of uh, 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 unitary representations of your group, and you want to project onto some ERAP, then you some average over all possible elements in that group. And that's why the representation theory for compact group is very similar to the finite group, because you can always hire integral. But it becomes probably non-trivial when it becomes non-compact group. OK, yeah, coming back to the ex exercise two. Now my code space is just one dimensional. I'm, I'm particularly interested in one particular state, not a sp uh, well, yeah, space of dimension one. Then, yeah, this is my not only a projector, but also a, the density matrix for my state. Now I have this equality. How do you calculate the entanglement entropy? Well, calculate the reduced density matrix read off the eigenvalue, take the von Neumann combination. Now, we don't take the, the full trace. We take a partial trace to, to investigate any non-trivial entropy. Say, uh, my A is my sum subsystem. This is my reduced density matrix on the, on the complement of A. You take a trace of A. But by the same token, that any non-trivial poly matrix have a zero trace. So when you take a trace over A, you, you, if you have a poly string of x1, i, c, y, dot, 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 c, and say that this is my part A and this is my subsystem B, then if I trace the trace on A, everything here should be non. Uh, everything here should be identity in order to survive the, that trace. So I can focus on. Can can you can you read it here? You can also push up that block. Ah uh, yeah right. So by copying that summation expression, I get 2 to the s g inside the stabilizer group trace over a of g. But I know that the only term that survives is such that g is uh, restricted to a is identity. Okay, And in that case, Tracing A does nothing but just multiplies a scalar factor by the dimension of that subsystem A. So it becomes like G restricted to B part and resolve the dimension factor here of 2 to the, the number of qubits in A. But this the stabilizer group, you collect a subset of uh, uh, poly operators <coughs> who support, whose ac action on A is identity. They are also form a group. So this is a sum, sum over some subgroup. So if we knew the cardinality of this group and we, we scale it, then we know that this is going to be a projector again. Oh, by the way, here the original uh, number of generators was n, exactly equal to n, because we are talking about a single state.
So I, I just uh, rescaled this summation part by the group order, which, we, I, which I don't know yet. I just denote it as SB. And I just write it that, the remaining part as projector. But that was my reduced density matrix. So where did you get 2 to the n in the denominator? Here. 2 to the n denominator comes from the expression for psi, where s is equal to n. I was considering a, yeah, a particular state, not a code space, one state. So s has to be equal to n. OK. So this is my reduced density matrix, which is proportional to a projector. But what's the spectrum of projector? It's either 1 or 0. In other words, your entanglement spectrum, the eigenvalue spectrum of a reduced density matrix is flat. It's either equally non-zero or just zero. And the entropy can be read off by counting the dimension. But we know the dimension by, here, by the factor here, by taking the trace on both sides. Left-hand side is equal to 1. This is some dimension here. Um, and yeah. So your entropy, uh, unfortunately, this s is confusing with the little s, but this is capital X, S, denoting the phenomenal entropy, is equal to um, n minus a minus sb. I mean, well, yeah, s is a bad notation. Let me call it g. That's our formula. So although stabilizer states are, uh, you may have heard that the stabilizer states are classically efficiently simulable. And this is all another manifestation of that fact, namely that your, uh, the entanglement entropy on some exponentially large Hilbert space can be computed using linear algebra over uh, involving exponents, in this case, just C2. Right, those are the Schmidt values. Entropy is log of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the Schmidt values are all equal. So all you care about is how many of them, right? And this is how many. G sub B was a uh, subgroup of all subgroup of a full stabilizer group, where you collect only elements that act trivially on and, and on A. In other words, supported on B only. That's the number of generators of that group. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, capital G B denotes the number of generators in that group. Yes. So log two of the cardinality. Uh, okay, so what we have learned from this is that your projector onto the code space was given by, well, the trace of the projector onto the code space was given by 2 to the n minus s, where s, little s, was the number of independent poly operators, where the independence was counted in terms of multiplicative relations. Yeah, whenever you have a one more stabilizer generator, you are having a full Hilbert space image. Well, you should ask it the other way around. How would you specify a stabilizer group? You, you literally write down some, some generators inside that group. And then all you have to do is to check the redundancy in that. But your calculation boils down to some linear algebra rank calculation over the binary field. So it's just a cost elimination. That was my 
review for the stabilizer codes. Um, <coughs> Okay, so now let's talk about, let's apply, apply the, the, the well, yeah, apply the technique of stabilizer code into the, into the lattice. So you, you get, you get a, you get many qubits, which we'll take to infinity later. And then we wish to define some code on top of it by specifying uh, stabilizer generators. And to make a connection with the physics, my stabilizer generator will be just terms in the in some Hamiltonian. And to make the connection to the stabilizer code more explicit, I only consider Hamiltonians of this form. It's sum of local terms, the locality we cannot give up, but each of the terms is a tensor product of Pauli matrices. There's no, uh, well, there could be some plus minus sign, but it's not terribly important as long as there's no frustration. So for, the sake, for, the, for this lecture, we always tune it to plus one. So, and to make use of the language of stabilizer code, I require that these terms are commuting with one another. Then you can simultaneously, well, then the question about energy spectrum becomes trivial, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that. And you're only left with the code space which corresponds to the ground state. And the one, one uh, very important example is given by Kitayev uh, by tweaking good old district case theory from, I don't know, maybe 60s or 70s. So we imagine a square lattice uh, yeah, just a simple square lattice and we place qubits on the edges so on. And I have two types of terms. Uh, this notation is terrible because it doesn't really specify your Hamiltonian. Uh, I said one term consists of product of four x operators, but I didn't say where. Uh, and the where is given by this diagram. So for each vertex, you consider the four qubits that uh, uh, are residing on the edge that be at one vertex, and you assign, and you lay out your axes according to those. And the second term is you focus on one uh, plaquette or square and you write down and the, the, the four z's corresponds to here. And you should be familiar with the fact that these two terms commute because they always overlap on even number of edges, zero or two. Okay, well, now get, getting back to the Frank's question, how many uh, stabilizer generators are here? We have given how many, well, how many qubits are here in the first place if I put a periodic boundary condition? So number of qubits is, well, number of horizontal uh, 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 edges, there are, say, L by L, and the number of vertical edges is again L by L, so there are two, two times L squared number of qubits, and 
number of stabilizer generators that are X type, the vertex type, how many have we assigned? We defined one for each vertex. So it's precisely L squared. And uh, the number of plot head terms is again uh, L squared. Okay, well, they add up to the final number. So can we say there is no, enco no encoded logical qubits? No, we shouldn't say that because we haven't checked whether they are independent. Um, obviously, if you multiply all of them, so here's a one generator. If I multiply another generator here, that it will map like this. If I multiply another one there, it will be like that, and so on. And you can multiply another row of these operators to push these operators like this. And if you multiply all of them over the, over the lab lattice, then each edge acquires uh, two factors of x that will cancel off. So the number of relations for x type is, again, 1. Namely, if you multiply everything, then I get identity. And the same is true for z type. So no, number of independent ones Number of independent ones are again, well, not again, I'm sorry, uh, is L, L squared minus 1. And if you subtract that, this number from this, then you get 2, right? And this 2 is my, um, my code space dimension. Well, the log of that. So the ground state, the code space is fourfold. There are four states in it. And what are the uh, and what are the operators that transforms in that subspace? Uh, what are the logical operators? So you have heard that the set of all logical operators are those that commutes with the stabilizer, but happens not to be in the stabilizer group. So I denote it as like this, where the perp means that it's commuting with the, with the stabilizer in it, but it's not in the stabilizer group. Um, let me just give you an answer, and then, uh, <coughs> and then tell you how to systematically derive these results using going through some topological invariants. Okay, one answer is if you consider this operator, then it always meets a vertex an even number of times, like two, so it commutes. And sigma z term obviously commutes. No trouble with that. So this becomes one element, well, can, one candidate in that stabilizer group. Now, how do you know that it is not in the stabilizer group? Well, if it were in the stabilizer group, we should be able to write down this particular operator in terms of products of those, the stabilizer generators. But generators are always of the form of this square plug head. So if I multiply any plug head, then it becomes like this. If I visualize the arrangement of sigma z's by coloring the edge that it acts on, then originally it was a straight line and after multiplication of one element in the stabilizer group, I deform the, the loop in, that, in this way. <coughs> the fact that I didn't change was the fact that the string didn't end. It's, it's, it's still a loop. 
And you can convince yourself that however you multiply these plockets, the fact that it is a it is not broken loop doesn't change. And that proves the fact that it is not in the stabilizer group, so it qualifies to be a uh, logical operator. Another one is Uh, sigma x operator acting on that uh, uh, set of edges. And if I color the, the dual edge that the edge where x is acting on, I, do, I draw uh, a perpendicular small edge, then I will, I will have a loop on that dual lattice. And this similar uh, uh, argument holds. Whenever you multiply the stabilizer generator, of, stabilizer generator of x type, you can deform your loop, but you never break it. So that again uh, proves that this operator is, is a logical operator. And you can always uh, rotate the lattice 90 degrees, because there's no, nothing prevents you from doing that. And uh, the z strings and the x strings, and another x string, and you can find these two sets of uh, logical operators that would act on my four-dimensional code space, the ground space. Okay. Well, if you heard this argument first time, then you should be suspicious about what I'm saying. Why? Well, I have found two logical operators and uh, found a, uh, 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 two sets of it. So by counting, it matches. But it's somehow, well, not too satisfactory because it was totally different calculation. The, how, how, the, the, the way I counted the relation was to m multiply everything together to, to see there's one. But how would I know that there, that's exhaustive? I haven't argued about that. I just claimed it, and it appears to be true, and it appears to be consistent. But there's a logical possibility that I missed some relation here and I count the number of logical, op logical qubits too fewer, and I somehow match that too few number by some number. So, yeah, you, I, the, the computation is not finished. You should not be convinced at this point that your Tori code encodes two qubits. So, to make that more formal, uh, I, sh I must introduce you the language of homology. Um, so, yes. Um, but why can't we uh, say that we count the number of qubits? Uh -huh. uh, so the all, all possible configurations just two time two to the power of number of qubits. And then we subtract, subtract number of constraints. And just because we have the rebound, we can just, we can just calculate all the plaquette constraints and all the star constraints. That's all. Why, why is it not strict? OK. Uh, we will encounter very non-trivial examples later, probably on Thursday. But I insist that not counting number of relations is highly, highly non-trivial task, especially when you have infinite, well, large sequence of lattices. Uh, another, well, another way to see that problem is to think of, well, not only the uh, square lattice, but some other lattice, for oh, example. Yeah. Enough. Well, yeah, for this particular example, you, you could argue, yes, yes. I, I <laughs> uh, but I, I'm just saying it's not always trivial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then here's an example. 
not, not example, but another way of thinking about it. Let me uh, associate uh, instead of drawing this square lattice with the qubits on edge, I could e equally write a lattice, a square lattice with the two qubits per site. There's nothing different. I just move the qubits on the edges towards that corner. And it's just the same thing. I just rearranged it. But then my plocket operator would look like like this. And the star operator would look like uh, Well, I, I leave this exercise to you to show that this diagram is equal to this. But in that representation, how would you count a constraint? Well, I did nothing, but you encounter a problem, <laughs> which means there's a problem with the argument. OK, let's get back to the homology. Um, so. Uh, we're talking about topological phases, and we, uh, we, we must understand where the word topology comes from. And here's the connection. I give you a surface. Well, here's a torus. I could connect another torus or something else. I could keep doing it. And I could draw equally a sphere. Well, intuitively, they are different. But whenever you say independent, different, distinguished, whatever, that kind of notation, you should specify under what transformations are they different. They are different under deformations. Well, deformation is, again, a tricky business. But uh, uh, so more precise way to think about it is if I were to write down a a map from here to here that are one to one and it covers everything and it's continuous, can I write it that? Under that function mapping, are they different? That's the more precise version of uh, speaking of difference. And you would say, oh, well, intuitive, intuitively, well, here I have hole one, two, three. Here I don't have any holes. But now how you define holes? And you can ask these questions again and again, and all the way down to some set theoretical question, if you are very serious about it. But how, how, how can we tell the difference? And the homology is one answer. So it's a very non-trivial idea arising early 20th century, probably Poincaré and others. You think of a triangulation. So you fill out your space using only triangles and glue the edges together. So if you are modeling a, a, some inhomogeneous system on a console or, or some, some software like that, you would encounter this meshing procedure, which is not always easy. Now, I suppose I do that. I did that. No, just 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 a triangulation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, ar arbitrary thing. And another triangulation here. Of course, I could introduce different triangulations for that for the same surface. Oh. Well, I'm not defining triangulation, but let's put that aside. <coughs> I just resort to your intuitive understanding of triangulation. Yeah. And then. I think of, this is a very non-trivial step in, 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 the, in, the, in the discussion of homology. I think of three groups generated by vertex, edge, and face. What, what does that mean? I literally label well, vertex number one, vertex number two, well, V1, V2, V3, V4, and so on. I label them all. Okay. By the same token, I label edge one, edge two, and so on. I label them all. 
And also, I label all the faces. And you consider all possible formal linear combinations of those edge labels. I'm oh, sorry, this is, has to be. There's no topology here. There's no geometry here. I just literally write down some combination of labels and put the coefficients 0 and 1, or 1, I'm sorry. And I take, and I look at this collection of all of those. There's no convexity. There's no geometry. V here has, does not contain any information about the manifold. It's just a label set. It's a symbol. Nothing. Just symbol. Oh, okay, so typical elements in that in this set. Uh, v1, v3, v5. That's one element. Oh, again, the plus sign here does not mean anything. It's just a, a placeholder to separate my vertex label writing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I could put comma, yeah. And I, yeah. Three, four, yeah. These are typical elements in that set. And likewise, you define C1 associated with the edges and C3 associated with the F. So at this point, these three sets does not remember anything but the number of edges, uh, uh, vertices, and faces. Yes, yes. That's another way of phrasing, yes. Can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, C0, C1, C, I'm sorry, C2 does not remember anything about the manifold but the number of them. Okay. Now I, I think of the relation among, well, some maps of, um, uh, between the two. which is often called the boundary map, which mimics the usual notation of boundary, but formally bears nothing. So if you give me a face symbol here, yeah, like this is element of C2, single face, and I define the boundary, boundary, this is just a de definition, to be the the three edges that surrounds the face. This is the place where the uh, information about the triangulation comes in. Set themselves do not know about triangulation. They just label combination. The boundary map knows about the triangulation. So in this case, E1, E2. That's the definition. And likewise, I define for edge, the boundary of an edge, to be V1 and V2. Yes? Uh, I'm glossing over the orientation uh, subtlety, but well, Yes, there is an orientation, but I'm dealing with the Z2 coefficient, so everything is orientable. But, so, yeah, I can answer your more elaborate answer later. Yeah. Okay, I define two maps. Now, how, how can I uh, define a map for, say, this one? Well, I, I'm, I'm still defying, so please do not ask why I'm doing it. <laughs> According to this definition, I would write what v1, v2, and v2, v3. And I introduce a new rule. Whenever I have two of them, I just remove it. That's my rule. 
I, uh, yeah. Yes. So formally, C0, C1, C2 are formal linear combinations of the vertices, edges, and faces over the binary field. And I'm defining the boundary map by specifying its action on the basis elements and extend it by linearity. Uh, yeah, you did it. <laughs> Okay. So now here comes the big claim. Here comes the big claim. You can extract topological invariants from those maps. And here's the construction. Well, still definition, sorry. So I define the linear maps with the coefficients in the binary field, 0 or 1. And I consider, consider the kernel of this. Kernel means the elements in the domain that values to 0. So for instance, I could have, in, in case of H, H2, well, yeah, I had a one face, for example. Uh, no, let's not do that one face. Let's look at. The, yeah. You did not say. You did never put label on on the boundary. No, I didn't. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the convention for the boundary maybe is that it 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 carries the notation from the higher dimension thing. CM? Oh, yes. What was the question? Image? Yeah, I, I didn't explain that image yet. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm just explaining the kernel. Yeah, kernel of a linear map is uh, the vectors in the domain that values to zero. So if I had a long loop that happens to be consisting of uh, a closed loop uh, of, of edges, then if I consider the combination of all, every, every edge here, and then I take a linear, the boundary map, and each edge will generate the one vertex here that will be canceled by my rule that everything is mod 2, rule that you know, the boundary contribution at that point will just cancel off. So, my somehow very exotic definition uh, contains the intuition about the boundary lessness. Now, what's the image? Image is not a term that is commonly used, but whenever you have a linear map from A to B, then That's my kernel. And that's my image. Image is anything that is mapped by some vector in the domain. Anything that is mapped by M from the domain. And here, the modding is when you do the abelian group. When you quotient out a, a, a abelian group by a sub, subgroup, then you treat the elements in that uh, subgroup as zero. Adding them amounts to zero, and addition and group operation just carries over. So, so why is the, this image a subgroup? Why is image a subgroup? That's that. Oh, uh, well, image is a subspace. Yeah, but why is it a subgroup? No, no. Image of M leaves it here. Yes. Kernel of M leaves here. Yeah, but, but you divide the kernel of delta I by the image of delta I. I plus one. So we had a.
Yeah, so kernel of the delta 1 lives here. Image of delta 2 lives here again. So you can take a, oh, why is the image of delta 1 a subgroup of kernel delta? Uh, image of delta 2 is a subgroup of delta 1. Good question. I did not show this, sorry. I should have shown it, but you can just, by brute force calculation, you can show that. Well, I can easily check it here. Anything on, on, this, uh, on this side, take a basis element, triangle, map it to the boundary, which consists of a collection of three edges. Take a, a boundary in the, in the vertex that translates to here. But you always get pairs of it. So it's zero. So I verified the equation for basis elements. Therefore, it holds for the entire map. Um, I'm a little bit confused by the triangulation procedures. Uh -huh. Can I alternatively think about this in terms of defining differential forms for like arbitrary shapes and then successfully applying like Stokes' theorem from base to uh -huh. surface to uh, you are probably right, but you are too far too advanced. We're not talking about differential forms here. It's just a combinatorial object. There is, is, is finite. Uh, how, how would you triangulate a sphere, for example? Tetrahedron, the, the surface of tetrahedron is surface. So tetrahedron gives much a, a triangulation. And my square lattice, uh, almost triangulates the torus, except that it's not triangle, it, there are squares, but you can always divide the squares into triangles. So that gives you one triangulation for torus. Yeah. There are always a finite objects for a given compact set. Uh, the connection to the drum cohomology that you are thinking of is another deep theorem that they are equivalent. Okay, so let me, oh, yes, this one? Okay, so when, when can you verify a map is zero? You look for the image of a basis vector, map it, map it according to the description of your map, verify that it is zero. What is the basis for C2? Faces, a boundary of a face is a collection of three edges. And the boundary of that three edges results in zero by my convention where the two vertices are zero. OK, uh, let me convince you, although I'm, uh, yeah, there's no time for me to prove it. Let me convince you that this object is topological invariant. In particular, it does not depend on the triangulation. That's the intuitively most important part. The whole thing, the whole thing. Well, yeah, if you just, yeah. C012 were depending upon the triangulation, which was arbitrary. It, it was up to my choice. And the corresponding boundary map, is a delta 1, delta 2, they of course depend on my choice. But somehow, magically, this combination is not is, is independent of my triangulation. That's, that's what I'm going to claim. Okay? That's the most important par part in, the, in, in, in homology. It's, so. Uh, I'll, I'll do it pictorially. And I'll just focus on the H1.
just look at one triangle. Just, just one triangle. There will be other triangles in my surf on my surface that will comprise my, my manifold. But just focus on this. I'm going to introduce one more vertex here. And then I'll draw, I'll draw uh, well, I convert one triangle into three triangles by subdividing that big triangle to you know, more final, finer one. Just a one little uh, vertex change. Would that change this? Let's, uh, let's understand that, that first. So we should investigate the elements in this kernel. Otherwise, collection of edges whose endpoints are meeting. Right? So there will be some, you know, some loop that might pass through this edge and then leave the leave, leave this triangle in some some up some other way. The line should not end because I do not I, I, I must not have any uh, vertex left over. And then face to edge. So I consider the collection of three edges, if they come from triangle, then I consider them as zero. So in this uh, quotient group, this collection of edges is equivalent to, let me use other. It's equivalent to this because there are difference because their difference is only this triangle which would come from by the boundary map from an, from, from a face so whatever element of this quotient group you give me i should be able to find another representative that represents the same object but deformed in this way If I have a one more vertex, would that situation change? I would have some representative of, from this uh, quotient group whose path will, would look like this. And it should pick some edge inside my triangle. But any deformation by a triangle are equivalent. So I could represent the same elements by this one or by that one, and so on. They are all equivalent. So if you had a, a homology representative with respect to this triangulation, then you should be able to find an equivalent representative in that picture too. You effectively removed one vertex in that procedure. So by considering the local fluctuation coming from this uh, extra boundary map, you can effectively remove the finer uh, uh, triangulation all the way up to your, uh, uh, your full uh, sur surface, unless there's some obstruction you encounter. So this local move is always possible. Now, suppose you, are, you have, so the, now the goal, goal is to show that this object is independent of any triangulation. Give me two triangulations. Superpose them, not in the quantum mechanical sense, but just imagine. <laughs> Superpose them like this. And according to the vertex from the other, just refine the original one. And you can do the same thing for the other side too. So that the resulting triangulation are the same. So you, you can compute the homology group with respect to any refinement but any two given triangulation would result in the same refinement. So this object will be insensitive to your triangulation. Therefore, it only depends on the surface you started with. Just because you're modding out by the triangulation. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the core intuition about any homology. Uh, the interpretation. <coughs> Going to the drum homology is a bit different because that's co-homology, not homology. That's more tricky. But 
essentially the same. You consider the local deformation, uh, any refinement will result in the same thing, and two independent uh, uh, local, well, the, the cellular model will result in the same thing. I should stop here. Um, Bruno, you still have. Oh. Go until 12.30. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Great. <laughs> but, but at the end, so like for this example that you gave with these yes. keyholes, what would be somehow H1? Ah, good question. Um, uh, well, yeah, yeah, let's do it here. So I know that the, the finer structure of triangulation is not important, but the global ones are important. And uh, H1 is represented by, well, by this loop, by this loop, and Those four loops are uh, 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 four, four independent representatives of this homology group. For torus, you would have only this part. For a sphere, you would have nothing. So what about the loop? Well, there's, more, there's more. There are more loops, yes. The there, are, there are more loops. Actually, you, know, you can think of uh, infinitely many ones. But say this one. No, it's uh, this one is yes. Oh, yeah, th this one's trivial. Um, like 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 this one. Uh, you can bring these two loops here, and then consider a face that that mitigates the two. You can combine them, and it becomes this. So this the, the white loop actually the this loop plus that loop. Yeah. yeah. Somehow, ab I know it, it's very abstract. I mean, that's why it's a non-trivial idea. We started with uh, triangulation, which is very geometry object. We constructed a label set from that triangulation, and then we took the that weird combination and realized it is independent of my original triangulation. Exactly. Uh, so we primarily talked about the surfaces, the two-dimensional manifold. But in general, if you have an n-dimensional manifold, then you would have C0, C1, all the way up to Cn. Here, the triangulation amounts to putting the simplices in, in your uh, set. So simplex in one dimension is an edge. Simplex in two dimension is a triangle. Simplex in three dimension is a tetrahedron, and so on. <laughs> uh, and then you uh, similarly define the boundary maps uh, on this. On this, this is called chain complex. In such a way that composition of any near uh, uh, neighboring boundary maps results in zero. And then you define, and you consider the the, the quotient of the kernel to image, and you can show that that's also an invariant. So n-dimensional manifold comes with uh, n homology groups. Uh, I'm sorry, n plus one homology groups. Although I, I didn't talk about the H naught and H, the top one. Uh, there, you if the i index goes beyond the dimension of your uh, manifold, then you just declare it zero. That's a convention. Yeah. Okay. Why does it have anything to do with the Tory code? 
go back to the uh, here. And let's focus on the uh, focus on sigma z logical operator. If I apply sigma z on the on top of any ground state, there is a two anti-commuting term with that operator. One leading here and the other leading there. Okay? So if I consider the the square lattice as my cellulation, well, yeah, this is a word. Uh, triangulation is re reserved for when you really com decompose your manifold into triangles or simplices, and more general term is just cells. Yeah, if I consider this as a cellular decomposition, and I consider this edge being, uh, act well, yeah, this edge being the one element of C1, and the map from given Pauli operator that acts on the ground space to the location of your excitation. That map is exactly the boundary map I described. Right, let me repeat. Th this map, this map has a counterpart in the Tor called Hamiltonian, when you uh, implement, when you uh, think of this way, uh, elements of C1, a collection of edges, you apply sigma z, and then you look for the positions, in this case vertex, where the excited, the, the E particles live. And that association is exactly the boundary map in the homology. What about the delta 2? So delta 2 maps a phase 2 set of edges. Now I consider the plot head operator. And I interpret C2 as a collection of faces. And I look for the product of Hamiltonian terms that, also, that are associated with, that, with those plockets. Then I'm left with the edges, the boundary of that collection of plockets, and that is exactly the boundary map in the homology, or of one dimension higher. Okay. Now what about the homology, the, the quotient group? I look for set of edges, in my case, uh, uh, the, the location of sigma z operator that does not have boundary, but the boundary image was the, the location of x station. So I look for operator after uh, whose, whose action results in no x station. That's the kernel. And I consider those operators modulo stabilizer group, but the stabilizer group was the image of this delta 2. You give me a face, and I generate a stabilizer generator. Any linear combination will be also a stabilizer, so I mod it out. What I'm left with is exactly that homology. Sure. Um, so this is this is also, well. I'm I'm attaching uh, uh, cellular homol homology using the Hamilton the toric code Hamiltonian. I consider set of edges. Yeah. Place sigma z there. Look for the excitations, and this will leave them on vertices.
So edges are elements of C1. Using the Hamiltonian, I ended up in some collection of points, the vertices, which are elements of C0. And uh, if, if you look at the just association, essentially this picture, it's exactly as if I calculate the boundary of the edge and I read off the boundary. Yeah, this is my This is my the dimension one boundary map. And then I look at the stabilizer group. So stabilizer group for the sigma z part is defined as for every face. So I for every face look at the edge. and place sigma z there, and that's my stabilizer. But phase was an el element of C2. The set of edges that comprises the boundary of the phase is an element of C1. And this whole association is exactly delta 2. So I want to understand the dual feature for X. I still the same? Uh, you can do it two ways. Uh, you can just stick with it. Uh, in that case, you want to think of the dual lattice and then replace the uh, vertices into uh, plockets in the dual lattice. and to run the same game. Or some, some more sophisticated way, way is to think of the linear functionals on this. But that doesn't buy you any intuition further, I think. So I suggest you stick with this homology picture. And the, the, final, the final element, uh, this is not very visible. kernel of del 1, what are they? They are set of edges whose boundary is 0. In other words, some operator placed on the edges that results in no excitation. In other words, it commutes with your Hamiltonian uh, uh, stabilizer group. So elements of this kernel qualifies to become a logical operator. But I, we do know that logical operators come in variety of shapes, because we can always multiply stabilizers. And I claim that th those stabilizers are precisely the image of this uh, del 2 map. Because where does the stabilizer come from? It, come, it, it is associated with a face, and you look for and you look at the edges of it. And that's my precisely uh, stabilizers. Uh, identify the position. That's what I meant. Yeah. Oh, how do how do I look for the station? Yeah. Well, start with the ground state, apply some operator, and then you measure the Hamiltonian terms. That's how you would theoretically look for the station, right? Yeah, but in this stabilizer Hamiltonians, the calculation is particularly easy because you ha only have to check the whether given operator is commuting or anti-commuting with the term. So then looking for the edge is then you don't use the stabilizers. Well, here, here the, look, the excitation finding was a bit more involved because you have to check the commutativity relation. But here, it's, it's more of a tautology. We defined the stabilizer group generators associated with the boundary of a face. Is it possible to 
explicitly write down what channel of delta one is, like as a group, and then what image of delta two is, and then take the coaching and see what becomes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes and no. Uh <laughs> so I give you a formal way to how to rigorize our previous calculation. And you still have to calculate the homology of a torus. Uh, and that's left to you, but it's not, it's not difficult to, uh, uh, it's not difficult to explicitly do it. I told you that any refinement by adding a vertex in the middle of any other plaquette does not change your homology. So remove the reverse the process, remove as much vertices as possible. And in, in, in the case of torus, you will be left with just a single plaquette, two edges, one vertex. Right? So your linear algebra problem becomes uh, one dimensional <laughs> uh, linear space, two, four, two dimensional linear space, two one-dimensional linear space. So it's a final calculation. Do it. <coughs> Can you comment on the relation, like what I do to H1? Is it the dimension of H1 that gives you the Euler character? Thing? Euler characteristic is, is uh, uh, OK. The Euler characteristic is an alternating sum of of all across all dimension. I, I forgot the exact sign, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So Euler characteristic does, n does not only depend on H1, but also on the H0 and 2. But in this case of connected compact surface, they are always one dimensional. So they, they contribute 2 there. Um, yeah. Dimension of the group. Good question. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, the hardcore homology, you should put integer coefficients in front instead of Z2 elements. And then the dimension is the, the non-portion part. Uh, and But if over the F2, if F2 is a field. So you can, here the dimension is a dimension as a vector space, as a vector space. Yeah, uh, well, the, it's an e excellent exercise. Compute the, compute the homology of the t two torus by looking at the uh, cell relations consisting of a single face. You identify two edges here, and uh, all vertices are identified. So there are really a single point, and there are two edges, one face. So compute it. Okay, yeah, that, that's the connection where we talk about topological, topological phases in, for this, at least for this particular example. The good thing of this abstract machinery is that you are now free to go beyond two dimensions. So you now have a machinery to define a, uh, at least a stabilized Hamiltonian by thinking of these boundary maps. So for example, in, in three dimensions, I can now define a three-dimensional toric code in words. Uh, for each two cells, the plaquettes, you associate the z's uh, around the, uh, around, yeah, z's around that face. And then that's my uh, uh, del two. And del one, you, that corresponds to the insertion of a single operator and look for the edges. <coughs> well, a 3D situation is a bit more involved, so I'll continue it, but yeah, I should start with the remark that using this homology language, you can go to any higher dimensions uh, using any cell relation. And one advantage of this approach is that I started with a lattice, I, I'm sorry, the, the square lattice, uh, the associated the homology language, but homology language does not depend upon triangulation. In other words, the Tory codes ground manifold, as long as you can associated this homology language does not depend on, on your lattice structure. That's another feature of a tor toric. Uh, I, I will stop here and let's go have lunch. Yeah, I, but 
I'll take questions first. Yeah. Yes. get the code space because code space the dimension of the code space from this uh -huh. but can you comment on how you can get the logical operators uh, what are the, well there were there were not separate calculations I calculated I identified the h1 with a set of logical operators right but they were exhaustive there were everything that I could find therefore you knew you know the code space dimension immediately. Is it only when you do Z2 homology that you, you can uh, remove the orientation from faces and, and edges? Well, over the orientable surface, you can do the ZP homology, for, well, or ZN for any N. Uh, nice thing about the Z2 is that any 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 manifold is orientable over Z2. So, in other words, well, that manifests itself in the in the fact that Tori code over Z2, the qubit variables can be defined on the RP2, say. Uh, using this theory, is it possible to distinguish between torus and uh, between two circles? Torus versus two circles? Yes. Like just co confusing the gamology. Uh, yeah, but but the circles are one-dimensional. What do you mean by? Yeah, and uh, yeah. this is why image is zero. Image is zero by. Yeah, eight zero will distinguish the two. Huh? Eight zero will distinguish the two. Yeah. There are more questions. Thank you very much.